Hello 3D printing friends! Today on the BV3D channel we're going to build a Wi-Fi print monitor that works with OctoPrint. It's the project from the September 2019 Alien 3D UFO Mystery Box. Stick around and we'll get into it right after this. I'm Brian and you are watching BV3D. Hi, welcome back. Hey, if you're new here and you're wanting to learn about cool 3D printer upgrades, 3D modeling, and other 3D printing related stuff, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. Okay, so today we're going to build the Wi-Fi print monitor that came with the Alien 3D UFO Mystery Box for September 2019. This is a cool little device with a super small Wi-Fi enabled Arduino board called the Wemos D1 Mini and an equally miniature OLED screen with a resolution of 128 by 64 pixels. The project was developed by a person known as Chrome who published it as an instructable. As soon as I saw some of the case designs for this, I knew I had to put a little twist on it. This project was perfect to mount in a miniature Mac case. Now, this case is a Mac Classic from around 1990, but it's nearly identical to the original 128K Mac from 1984. In terms of looks, the Classic had a smoother case design and was more of a very slightly off-white color. And since I have white filament, but I don't have 1980s Apple beige, which is a shame, I decided that I was going to make this as a Mac Classic. Oh, if you know of a filament with a good close match to 80s computer beige, let me know in the comments. Also, as I started looking on Thingiverse for a compact Mac model to turn into a case for this project, I saw that somebody had already done it, and that somebody is Thingiverse user Tux Project. Their design is awesome and super detailed. The bottom of the case is specifically designed to hold the Wemos D1 mini board, and it just slides right in. I printed the bottom part right side up and the main part of it upside down. A nice feature is that it has some little pins inside to help align the screen. Unfortunately, those pins are spaced for a slightly larger screen, so I did need to load the model into Tinkercad and move the pins to fit the screen that I got from Alien 3D. So I've uploaded that as a remix of Tux Project's model, and I've got a link in the description. So there are a few things that we need to do to get this project assembled and working. And I'm starting with the easiest thing first. First, we need to print the case pieces. Second, we need to solder four wires between the Wemos D1 Mini and the screen. That's it, just four. Third, we'll assemble the case with the electronics inside. And fourth, we'll install code on the Wemos to make it work. The code is going to require the Arduino IDE, a board definition file, and a few libraries. Now, since we're essentially building a tiny Mac, we'll do it on a Mac as well. And Windows users, don't worry, the process of getting the code and libraries installed is pretty much the same for you. Really, the only difference is going to be in the Arduino IDE installation, and I'm going to refer everybody to the instructions on the Arduino site to get the IDE installed. If you're just not comfortable watching all this being done on a Mac screen, my friend Chris Riley's got an excellent tutorial on this project as well, and I encourage you to check out his YouTube channel, Chris's Basement. His video is linked in the description. And speaking of the description, go there to look for a link to the files for this little Mac case on Thingiverse. The link points to my remix of the original by Tux Projects. Download the files and print them out, and while they're printing, we can keep working. Next, it's soldering time. Now, we need to solder these two little boards together. There weren't any wires in the box to connect the two, so you'll have to look around for some wire. You won't need much, maybe eight inches of wire in total, cut into four two-inch lengths. Check your work area. Maybe you've got something you can use that already has a four-pin DuPont connector on one end. I may harvest the end of this stepper motor cable that I bought for a different project. That way, I only have to solder four things instead of eight. Chris Riley chose to do this too, and this is also a good idea if you're ever going to take this project apart. It's nice to be able to unplug a connector instead of desoldering stuff. Warning, this is not a soldering tutorial. If you're not comfortable wielding a handheld tool capable of melting metal, find a friend who is, or practice on an old circuit board first. As always, safety first. So I've clipped this connector off a couple of inches from the end of the cable, and I've stripped a little bit of insulation off the ends and pinned the exposed wire. That length of wire should give me plenty to work with, and the excess can just be bunched up inside the case. I'm plugging this in with the black wire connected to the ground pin on the display. That's my point of reference. So on the screen, the black wire is connected to ground. Solder that to the hole marked G on the Wemos. The green wire is connected to VCC, so solder that to the hole marked 5V on the Wemos. The red wire is connected to SCL, so solder that to the hole marked D5 
on the Wemos. And lastly, the blue wire is connected to SDA, so solder that, to the hole marked D2 on the Wemos. And that takes care of the wiring. So now let's put this little Mac together. We'll start by inserting the screen into the main part of the case. One thing I did was cut a little square of clear plastic from a blister pack so it looks like there's a glass CRT. If you want to do that, I'm in favor of it because although it's not perfect, it does help sell the illusion. So first in is the clear plastic. Next, the OLED screen and it goes in with a connector on the bottom. And because the space inside is limited, you'll want to have the connector already plugged in. And you're going to need a blob or two of hot glue or thick CA glue or something similar to hold it in place. I'm using hot glue. Next, slide the Wemos board into the bottom part of the case. And finally, snap the bottom of the case into the top. There. Now we have a very tiny Mac Classic. But now we need to breathe some life into it. So next up, dealing with the code. The first thing you're going to need is the Arduino IDE. And if you've been following some of my other episodes, we've installed it before when doing firmware updates on the ANET A8, for example. So if you already have it installed, great. If not, you can download it from the Arduino download page and you can install it by following the instructions on their Getting Started page, and both of those are linked in the description. Once you've got it downloaded and installed, we're going to need to add some stuff to it so that it'll be able to communicate with the Wemos. We're also going to need to tell the Arduino IDE where to find the board definition file for the Wemos. It needs this information so that it knows how to write data to the board. Now I've linked to the Instructable down in the description, so if you click that link, you'll end up on this page. You'll need to scroll down a bit, but what we're looking for is this. The links to the project's source code as well as links to the additional board definitions and libraries that need to be installed. Some of the libraries that are listed don't have links, and that's because they're included with some of the other things that we're installing. Windows users may need to install a USB serial driver to enable communication with the board, and the USB CH340G drivers are the first thing on the list. On the Mac, I simply plug the Wemos board in, and the computer recognized it as a USB serial interface. Actually, it considered it a serial network interface and prompted me to configure it, but I just canceled out of that. So at this point in the video, I'm operating on the assumption that you have the Arduino IDE installed on your computer and you've got it running. Now we need to tell the Arduino IDE where it can find the necessary board definition for the Wemos, and we'll do that by opening the IDE's preferences window. Inside, there's a field where we can add one or more URLs where board definition files can be found. So let's copy the link from Chrome's page, paste it in, and click OK to save the preferences. Now we can get that board definition into the IDE. Click the Tools menu, then point to Board, and click Boards Manager. In the Boards Manager window, type ESP8266 into the search field, and then install the Boards package that appears. It may take a minute or two for all of the information to be downloaded, so be patient. When it's finished, click the Close button. And now that the board definitions are loaded, let's select the one for the Wemos. Click the Tools menu, point to Board, and click Lowland, parenthesis Wemos, D1, R2, and Mini. We also need to tell the IDE that we want to reserve space on the board for the printer monitor settings file. So click the Tools menu, point to Flash Size, and click 4M, 1M SPIFs. Now I had to look up what SPIFs means. It's the Serial Peripheral Interface Flash File System. So basically, we're telling the IDE that the Wemos has four megabytes of built-in flash storage, and we're setting aside one megabyte of it for onboard file storage. The remainder is for code. If the Wemos isn't already plugged into the computer, we need to do that. And we need to tell the IDE which port it's connected to. Click the Tools menu, point to Port, and select the correct port. On the Mac, the Wemos presents itself as a USB serial port. My only other options are a Bluetooth connection and my Bose QC35 headphones, so for me, it's kind of obvious. If you're not sure, try this. Unplug the Wemos board and look at the list of ports. Then plug in the Wemos board and look at that list of ports again. This time there should be an extra one, and that should be the connection to your Wemos, so pick that port. Next up, we need to download the libraries for Wi-Fi and the OLED screen. So over on Chrome's Instructable page, let's click the link for the Wi-Fi manager. That takes us to its GitHub page. So click the Clone or Download button, then click the Download Zip button. 
Once that's downloaded, go back to Chroma's page and click the SSD 1306 link. Again, that goes to GitHub and again, click the clone or download button, then click the download zip button. We're skipping the link for the Arduino JSON item because it's now included in the source code download and we're going to be downloading the source code in a few minutes. Right now, we're going to get these two libraries installed. Check your downloads folder for the files. I'm using Chrome on the Mac and it doesn't automatically unzip the files. Safari does, so if your browser automatically unzips them, it probably moved the files to the trash. If it did, move them back to the downloads folder or put them on your desktop or somewhere else that you can get to them. Now, 99% of the time you want the file unzipped, but not this time, because the Arduino IDE has a handy feature where it can import libraries while they're still zipped. So, in the IDE, let's click the sketch menu, point to include library, and click add zip library. You'll be prompted to locate a zip archive, so let's navigate to the location with those two zipped library files. Select the Wi-Fi Manager zip file and click the Choose button. Importing the library happens pretty much instantly, so let's repeat for the OLED screen library, and that's the ESP8266 OLED file. With those libraries installed, let's download the source code. Click the link on Chrome's Instructable page. The source code is on GitHub, and like we've done so many times before, we'll click Clone or Download, and then click Download Zip. Now let's open the Downloads folder, unzip the Printer Monitor Master zip file, and open the resulting Printer Monitor Master folder. Inside that, open the Printer Monitor folder, then open the PrinterMonitor.ino file. This will open the entire Printer Monitor project in the Arduino IDE. Now, let's make sure that this project will compile. Click the button with the check mark up at the top left corner. It'll take a moment or two, but if everything goes according to plan, the IDE will tell us that it's done compiling and it will have a couple of status messages. If instead you end up with an error message, or two, or ten, you need to get that situation cleared up. Carefully read what the IDE is telling you and try to track down the problem. Since we're not editing any of the files, the most likely problem is not having a needed library installed or not having the board and the port selected on the Tools menu. So assuming the project was successfully compiled, let's try uploading it to the Wemos. Click the Upload button and wait. The IDE has to recompile the project and then send it to the Wemos. If everything is connected properly, after a moment, the screen should start displaying information. Starting now, I'm going to be referring to this as the printer monitor instead of the Wemos because it's assembled and it's got the code installed and its behavior is now more about the code than the hardware. Now since the printer monitor doesn't know what Wi-Fi network we want it to connect to, it puts itself in Wi-Fi access point mode. Yes, you now have a tiny Wi-Fi access point sitting next to your computer. So we're going to connect to the printer monitor's Wi-Fi network and then we can begin to configure it. On the screen, it will tell you the name of the Wi-Fi network that it has created. So I'll switch my computer to that Wi-Fi network, and as soon as my computer connects, I'm presented with a Wi-Fi configuration page. This is how we can tell the printer monitor which Wi-Fi network we want it to connect to. So I'll pick my Wi-Fi network from the networks that printer monitor can see, provide the password for that network so that it can connect, and click the Save button. Once that's done, the printer monitor will stop broadcasting its own Wi-Fi network, connect to my Wi-Fi network, and then the screen will show its IP address so that we can connect to it in our browser. And because the Wi-Fi network that my computer was connected to is no more, my computer automatically switches back to the one that I was on previously. If your computer doesn't do that, you'll need to reconnect to your regular Wi-Fi network manually. Now, the printer monitor only displays its IP address briefly after it boots up, so if you didn't catch it the first time, unplug the USB cable and plug it back in to reboot it. Make note of the IP address that you'll see on the screen after it powers up. But now that we've got the IP address of the printer monitor, we can type that into a web browser and get connected to it, and then we can finish configuring it. You can see here that the printer monitor's status is offline, and the reason it gives is that it needs the IP address or network name of the Octoprint server and the Octoprint API key. And this is a huge hexadecimal number that's unique to your Octoprint instance. Now, you probably already know the Octoprint server's IP address or network name since you likely connect to it on a regular basis, but the API key is something that we need to go get from the Octoprint server. So let's go get that key. We'll open a new tab in the browser and go pay a visit to the Octoprint server. 
I'm planning to have this printer monitor show me the status of OctoPrint on my Ender 3 Pro, so that's the OctoPrint server that I'm connecting to. Now that we are connected to the OctoPrint server, click the wrench menu to get to the OctoPrint settings page. In the list on the left, click API. Then we can copy the API key. Click the copy icon just to the right of the key's value. That copies the API key to the clipboard, and we can paste that into the printer monitor's configuration page in just a moment. So switch back to the browser tab where we've got the printer monitor. Let's click that icon that looks like a stack of three lines. It's commonly called a hamburger menu, and it was apparently given that name by people with a great imagination, or by hungry user interface designers. Printer monitor's menu appears, and we can click configure. And as soon as we do, we're asked to log in. The default login credentials are admin and password, so log in with that. And you can change that in just a moment to something a little more secure. Well, now we're on the configuration page, and let's paste in the API key here. And we'll set the OctoPrint host name. I'm setting mine to Ender 3 Pro, since that's the printer that OctoPrint is attached to. The printer monitor will display this name when either the printer or the OctoPrint server is offline. And this is handy if you have more than one printer, and you'll know which printer is having an issue. So here's where we enter the OctoPrint server's network address. You can either use the numeric IP address or its network name if you know it. This is the same thing that you entered a moment ago to connect to your OctoPrint server minus the HTTP bit at the beginning. Yours might be octoprint.local or 192.168.1.something. Mine is ender3pro.local, so I'll type that here. The OctoPrint port by default is 80, so I'll leave that alone. I'm skipping over the OctoPrint user and password fields. My OctoPrint instance isn't exposed to the outside world and I'm not using a proxy server to access it, so this doesn't seem to apply. The other settings here are whether to display the time when the printer is off, whether to use a 24-hour time display, whether to flip the display orientation, and this has to do with how the screen is physically mounted in the case. I showed using the standard orientation with the connector at the bottom. If you wanted to install it upside down with the connector at the top, then checking that box would flip it and it would appear right side up. You can set the theme color to suit your needs. This light green is fine for me. You can adjust your time offset here. My time zone is GMT minus five, so by setting it here, the clock display will be correct. And here, you can change the username and password needed to log in to the printer monitor. I'm gonna change the password review the settings briefly, and then click Save to save all of these changes. It does have the ability to display the weather if you like, and doing so will require you to have an open weather map API key and your city ID. I haven't done this on mine, but feel free to do it on yours. There is a link to the open weather site on this page. Getting an API key will probably require creating an account on the site and providing a bit of information to them. So that's pretty much it for the configuration. Now, if I start a print job, Printer Monitor can show me the status of it from pretty much anywhere, as long as there is a USB port to power it, and it's able to connect to my Wi-Fi network. And that's about it for this one. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of the video, and thank you for all the likes, comments, and shares. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell so you don't miss out on any cool 3D printing stuff. Now, if you like this episode, please give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down, but either way, please share your thoughts down in the comments. If you like the content that I'm producing and you want to help out, check out the description for ways you can do that. Shopping using the Amazon affiliate link really helps no matter what you're buying, and heck, even just subscribing is a great way to support the channel and help keep me making these videos for you. Well, now that I've got a very tiny Mac Classic to keep me informed about what my Ender 3 Pro is doing, I'm gonna go print something cool. You do the same, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>